In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria gratia plena Domine tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Iesus. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Today we celebrate the uh, feast of St. Gertrude the Great on this day in the uh, Benedictine calendar. And she has uh, St. Gertrude, uh, the distinction of uh, being the only female saint with that uh, appellation, the Great. There are other doctors of the church, and, and she's not one of them, but she's the only uh, female to be, to be given that title of, of the Great. Uh, she had the distinction, I guess you could call it this, maybe the divine predilection of being born on the Feast of the Epiphany in the year 1256, uh, January 6th. Uh, there is some speculation that she perhaps was orphaned at a very young age, or that her parents uh, presented her, uh, as did the parents of the Blessed Virgin, uh, to a Benedictine monastery when she was only four years old. And so she was raised in that monastery by Saint Mechtilda, uh, who was the younger sister of uh, Gertrude of, um, well, I can't remember the name of the, the, the place now, but there was also the, the abbess of the monastery was, was also named Gertrude. Uh, so she was raised uh, by these nuns uh, and received an excellent education in grammar, logic, and rhetoric, uh, as well as Latin. She, uh, she would later in her writings, uh, they said her Latin was uh, very, um, uh, she was short with ease and a comfort in Latin that was uh, uh, very, very well. Now this reminds me, this, this story here, of another saint, um, uh, Blessed Herman the Cripple. He was also raised uh, at a monastery by monks. And I don't know of any other uh, religion or, I don't know what you would call it, uh, institution in the world where you could simply bring uh, orphan children and they would be raised with a love and care as if uh, they, they belonged to the persons, right? Where else can you do that? Here's the Catholic Church 800 years ago, right, engaged in social welfare, which is a big buzzword these days. And the church has been doing this not just for 800 years, uh, but for 1800 years. Uh, and that was one of the hallmarks of the, the, the Christians, right? The early Catholics in the Roman times is that they were not like anybody else. These, these Christians were noted for their kindness and charity, even to strangers, even to enemies. And so we see that simply continued with, with St. Gertrude. And, and Deo Gratias, right? Uh, it, it were it not for, um, at this time, th those monasteries, those convents, that was your social welfare. Either your, your child was raised there or they... They, were, they died of exposure, no one would take care of them. Uh, so there was nothing else. And, and these, these um, uh, ancient religious, these, uh, they, they took care of that. They filled that social need. Uh, so she grows up, uh, receives an excellent education. And uh, when she was able, when she, when she um, came of age, she uh, professed with the nuns there. And she continued now uh, to teach in school and uh, she studied uh, philosophy, uh, grammar, logic, rhetoric. Uh, they said she was very congenial. She had a gift of winning over hearts. Uh, and this continued until she was 26, at which point she received the first of what would be a continuing series of visions uh, throughout the rest of her life. And at that point, a, a biographer writes of her that she went from grammarian uh, to theologian. And she said herself of, of that experience that it was, it was that single point where she called all of her previous knowledge, all of her previous um, uh, efforts in, in learning uh, secular knowledge, she said that was all wasted. Uh, she said, in fact, she called it a, a, a wicked past, as she said. Um, that's, that's a bit of, um, I would say, a poetic hyperbole there, and that knowledge is good. Uh, but again, if knowledge is not pursued for the right reason, if God is not the end of our pursuit of knowledge, it is vain. Uh, and, and it is even indeed it would be wicked and every all of us will say that all of us will say that when we arrive in heaven god willing and any part of our life that was not spent d directly solely for god we will see that it was wasted and we will be our own uh, most vehement accusers that we waste i wasted my life even at the convent even in the priesthood even here even there anything not done for god purely was wasted we will be the ones to say that and so that's what happens all, all the time when you have these, these nuns and these monks and these visionaries, when they have these visions, they're all unanimous in stating that God alone matters. It's one of the, one of the ways you can tell a, 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 true, a true visionary. Uh, so she, she uh, continued her, um, 
uh, life as a nun, uh, an exemplary nun, um, um, modeling all the virtues, humility, poverty, obedience, chastity. And she wrote very much. Um, in fact, her, her writings were very popular at the time. Uh, but we have three, only three primary writings we could say have survived until the present day. There's the Herald of Divine Love, is one of her books. Spiritual Exercises of St. Gertrude is another one. And then the Book of Special Graces. And that's on the graces to, uh, given to St. Matilda. Uh, so you know, she's, she's receiving visions, you know, she's writing these down, and, and this is at a time, you know, in, in the Middle Ages when, uh, we can make another apologetics note, you know, the world accuses the church of being uh, misogynistic, right, of hating women, of keeping women suppressed, and so on, uh, to which we have ample, ample evidence to the contrary, uh, Gertrude the Great being uh, one of them. Teresa of Avila, as we know, was, was um, a spiritual director to several bishops, uh, Catherine of Siena, a laywoman, she wasn't even a nun, was telling popes what to do. And here, uh, Gertrude the Great, right? She was sought out for her, uh, for her knowledge, for her spiritual direction. Uh, so it doesn't matter, right? In, 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 in God's plan, uh, you know, men and women have their place, but the saints are the saints, and everybody uh, pays them deference and respect uh, because they lead us to God. Uh, and she would be one of the first um, to, to give, I would say, greater shape to the Sacred Heart devotion. Uh, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, the Offices of the Sacred Heart, the Mass of the Sacred Heart uh, was written by, um, oh no, I'm drawing a blank on his name. He was right before Margaret Mary Alaco. She was the one who, who received those, those um, uh, visions from Christ, uh, the, the, those uh, locutions with Christ. You know, she would flesh it out and, and make it um, uh, popular with the help of um, Claude de la Colombière. But it was, um, now I can't remember his name. I'm going to remember it later. Uh, but he, he would write it um, about 150 years earlier. He was working already on getting that devotion going. Uh, but Gertrude, uh, she was the one who even uh, several hundred years before uh, was giving indications that this was going to be a devotion in the church in later centuries. Um, she once had a vision and um, uh, she was with our Lord and she laid her head on his breast, mystically speaking, and she felt the Sacred Heart through, through his breast. And she knew uh, that this is what St. John the Evangelist felt uh, when he had laid his, his head on our Lord's breast at the Last Supper. And she asked him, uh, why didn't you tell the world about the Sacred Heart in your Gospel? And he replied, uh, mine was not the task to tell the world about the Sacred Heart. Mine was to write a Gospel that would succeed in testing the greatest intellects until the end of time. Uh, but, to, but to disclose uh, the secrets of the Sacred Heart is reserved to a saint in later times. So that was a reference to St. Margaret Maralico. But we have this writing, right, from, from, from Gertrude the Great. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux would be another one uh, uh, who would speak about the Sacred Heart. Um, and this is how God works. Is he builds through the centuries, he builds up to devotions and he builds up to his works. And this is one of the ways that we know that God is operating in the world and in the, in the church, is you have this marvelous continuity and you have the, 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 these um, foundation, these building blocks being laid over the course of centuries. It's not possible to humanity, right? To any single human being or even a group of human beings, you can't have that kind of unity, that, that kind of... Um, uh, 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 we would say that that integrity that uh, that that is necessary for these these devotions, uh, so it's proof of God's uh, um, operation in the world. So Gertrude the Great had had the privilege of doing that, of of being part of that devotion to the Sacred Heart. Uh, she also had a great devotion uh, to the souls in purgatory. She would write that Saint Gertrude uh, prayer, which is said to release a thousand souls from purgatory. Um, also, she would write about nuptial mysticism. Is the, the, the religious sister, uh, the nun, as being the bride of Christ. And uh, th this would be something that uh, perhaps is you know, not, not thought about much these days, is that, is that nuns are the brides of Christ, uh, but it wasn't always understood uh, to be that way. And so St. Gertrude, uh, very much uh, by her theology, um, helped to advance that and make that more clear. This is indeed uh, the, the character of the religious, uh, the, the uh, female religious, is to be those brides of Christ. And the interesting thing about um, St. Gertrude the Great is she was never actually formally canonized. 
She was simply, uh, her sanctity was so great, it was recognized after her death, uh, veneration uh, began, prayers began, and her feast, uh, an office and a feast was written up, it was approved by the popes, and in fact her feast was extended to the ent entire church, uh, but uh, it was um, Clement the Twelfth was the one who extended uh, uh, that feast to the whole church. And so, um, you know, what we have is you know, that, that example that the, the saints, God works in the world through the saints, right? Uh, what would Christ do if he were still alive? What the saints do, right? And that's what God wants all of us to do, is that the way we make Christ alive in the world is uh, being his hands, his feet, right? His pen, his tongue. Uh, that, that is the way that we be Christ in the world. And we do that by not offering him resistance, right? by letting God's grace work in us, letting him do as he wills in us, by striving to be more and more conformed to that example where he said, uh, not my will be done, but thine. And we have that from the early example of St. Gertrude. At 26 years old, she saw that. And that's, that's a life, right? That's the life that we can live, um, if it be God's will, uh, by surrendering to him. Right? No longer doing what, what we will, having our goals, our desires, uh, but by having only his. So let's pray to St. Gertrude the Great uh, that we may correspond to God's grace and, and live that life as he deems fit. God bless you all in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.